at VOA One the Hits. DM us your name and your complete mailing address so we can get one out to you. All right, I'm Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Anna Mateo and John Russell. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Anna Mateo. Scientists studying the remains of ancient creatures say that large dinosaurs did not grow at the same rate. Some dinosaurs grew slowly. And steadily, others experienced a growth spurt as they neared adulthood. A growth spurt is when something or someone grows very quickly. For example, children usually have a growth spurt between the ages of 12 and 18. The same appears to be true for some dinosaurs. The research appeared recently in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B publication. To reach their findings, scientists cut through the fossilized bones of dinosaurs. They examined the yearly growth rings of the bones from eleven kinds of theropods. Theropods are a group of dinosaurs. That mainly walked on two legs, and include big meat-eating dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex, commonly known as T. rex. Reuters news agency reports that this new study provides a look into the lives of some of the most fearsome hunters ever to walk the earth. The research team looked at fossils from museums in the United States, Canada, China, and Argentina. They were able to cut into the fossilized bones of one of the world's most famous T. rexes, known as Sue. Sue is housed at the Field Museum in Chicago. The researchers used machines to cut into Sue's largest leg bones. These bones showed that the T. rex and its relatives, known as Tyrannosaurus, have a period of extreme growth during the years before adulthood. It also shows that they reached full adult size by around age twenty. Sue is about thirteen meters tall. She is believed to have lived to about thirty-three years. She lived in an area that is modern-day South Dakota, a state in the north central part of the United States. Other groups of large theropods had more steady rates of growth over a longer period of time. Examples of these include two kinds of North American dinosaurs, Allosaurus and Acrocanthosaurus. Another dinosaur from Antarctica, Cryolophosaurus, and a dinosaur recently discovered in Argentina, also grew slowly. The Argentinian dinosaur has not yet been named. But it was as big as a T. Rex. This dinosaur did not reach its full adult size until it reached about forty years of age. It is believed to have lived to about age fifty. Big theropods share the same basic body design. They walked on two legs, and had large skulls. 
and strong jaws. And of course, they had threatening teeth. I'm Ana Mateo. Six migrants listen closely as Mbaye Babakar Diof speaks to them. The 33-year-old man has faced his own difficulties as a migrant from Senegal to Spain. Today, Babakar is a nurse in the Spanish city of Bilbao. He also runs a non-profit organization that helps migrants in Bilbao, as well as young people back in Senegal. But Babakar tells the men, who have arrived from Senegal, Ghana, and Morocco, that he is no role model. Behind the appearance of success, he faces struggles. His difficulties come from years of mistreatment and abuse, while trying to repay his debts to human traffickers. I wish every one of you achieves your life goals, but I don't desire for anybody the complicated and tough journey that I went through, Babakar tells the group. He recognizes that such a message might seem unusual. After all, he has built a career in Spain that lets him fly home to Dakar to visit family. He earns enough money to send his family money throughout the year. He spoke to the group of migrants just before going to work at Bilbao's Basurto University Hospital. In recent months, he has been treating patients suffering from the effects of COVID-19. Dealing with the coronavirus crisis has been emotional and difficult for Babakar. I've seen people die at sea, but this is different, he says. I love my job, but there have been situations that have churned my stomach. Before Babakar called Bilbao his home, there were long nights sleeping in the open and selling street goods for migrant traffickers. Back then, his dream of becoming a nurse seemed impossible. He was 15 years old when he decided he wanted to go into the medical field. The year was 2003. Babakar had just gotten to the Canary Islands after a difficult and dangerous 10-day boat trip. He arrived hungry and extremely thirsty. But Red Cross volunteers provided immediate aid to the teenager and the 137 other migrant passengers. That instant, I promised myself that one day I would be a nurse, Babakar said. In Babakar's case, life changed for the better the day he met Spaniard Juan Gil. Today, he calls Gil Aita which means father in the Basque language of Spain. The man had employed Babacar to do some repair work in his home. They grew fond of one another quickly. Soon the young worker was eating every meal at Gil's home. The man's mother had recently died, and his daughter had just moved away. So Gil invited Babacar to move in with him. Babakar accepted. I told my daughter Mbaye was lucky, but she told me we had been the lucky ones with him, said Gil, a 74-year-old artist and retired art teacher. When Babakar was 28, Gil became his father through the legal action called adoption. Babakar was able to pay back his remaining debt, send more money to family, and begin nursing school. 
After finishing school, he found a job with the Basque Area Public Health Service. Babakar quickly turned his attention to his next goal, completing medical school and returning to Senegal. There, he hopes to work as a doctor for Sunu Gal, the non-governmental organization he established. The name means Our Fishing Boat in Senegal's Wolof language. The organization works to help migrants living in Bilbao as well as young people back in Senegal, where it is trying to build a school. The idea is not to tell them to migrate or to stay put, Babakar said of his organization's work. The goal is to infuse them with critical thinking to make informed decisions and not fall prey to the mafias. Imagine you are watching a movie in English. Perhaps it is a musical, such as Mary Poppins Returns. Oh, maybe all those things that you love so are waiting in the place where the lost things go. In today's Everyday Grammar, we will explore some of the words we just heard. In particular, we will explore adjective clauses that describe places. But first, let's begin with some definitions. Adjective clauses, also called relative clauses, are groups of words that modify or give further information about nouns. These clauses have a subject and a predicate. Consider this example. This is the city where I was born. In the example, I is the subject of the clause. Was born is the predicate. Where is a relative adverb. Together, the words where I was born make an adjective clause that modifies or describes the noun city. Our example sentence is one in which an adjective clause describes a place. Language experts Susan Conrad and Douglas Biber note that English speakers often use adjective clauses in regular, repeated ways. When describing places, Conrad and Biber note, English speakers often use the words where or that to begin an adjective clause. But sometimes they do not use any word at all, as we will see. The first way English speakers describe a place is with the structure, noun of place, plus where. Think back to our first example. This is the city where I was born. The noun of place is the word city. But in everyday speech and in writing, one of the most commonly used nouns of place is the word place. Consider the song There's a Place by the Beatles. In the song, the noun of place is place, and the adjective clause is the words where I can go. But where is not the only word that English speakers use to begin adjective clauses that describe places. In everyday speech, Americans also often use the word that. Consider this example. Imagine two friends are walking down the street. One might say to the other, Is this the restaurant that you were talking about? In the example, the noun of place is restaurant. 
the word that begins the adjective clause. But in some cases, Americans leave out the word that. So you might hear an American ask their friend the following question. Is this the restaurant you were talking about? For more information about why the word that disappears, please visit the earlier Everyday Grammar program, The Mystery of the Disappearing That. There are other ways that English speakers use adjective clauses to describe places. They might use the words in which or to which, for example. Such structures are mostly used in academic writing. They are much less common in everyday speech. Let's end this report with a quiz. At the beginning of this report, you heard the following words. Well, maybe all those things that you love so are waiting in the place where the lost things go. Can you tell where the adjective clauses are? Do the adjective clauses modify a noun of place, or do they modify a different kind of noun? Write us your answer in the comments section of our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm John Russell. <laughs> Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In the years just after the Civil War, America was led by Andrew Johnson. The Democrat rose from vice president to president when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865. Andrew Johnson soon found himself in a bitter struggle with Congress. In 1868, radical members of the Republican Party held a trial in the Senate. They tried to remove the president from office. But they could not prove their charges, and their effort failed by one vote. When the trial was over, Johnson had less than a year left in office. He retired to his home in Tennessee. By then, Americans had elected a new president. Larry West and Shep O'Neill tell the story of the election of 1868. <laughs> There was no question about the Republican choice for president. Party leaders wanted General Ulysses Grant. Grant had been head of the Union Army during the last part of the Civil War. Under his leadership, the Union had won. And now he was the best-liked man in the country. Wherever Grant went, Former soldiers waited to shake the hand of the man who had led them to victory against the Confederacy. The Democratic Party had a much more difficult time choosing a candidate for president in 1868. Forty-seven men wanted the nomination. After several votes during its convention, the party failed to choose one above the others. Finally, party leaders looked for a compromise candidate. They chose Horatio Seymour, a former governor of New York State. He won the nomination on the 22nd ballot. Seymour, at first, said he could not accept the honor. He said he did not want to be president. But finally, 
after much urging from other party leaders, he agreed to run against Grant. The presidential campaign was a strange one. Neither Grant nor Seymour campaigned very hard. Grant told his advisors he would take no part in the election campaign. Seymour spent much of the time working on his farm. The real campaigning was done by party supporters. Republicans urged Union men to vote as you shot for Ulysses Grant, the man who won the Civil War. They warned that Horatio Seymour and the Democrats were all secret rebels in their hearts. Seymour's supporters spent most of their time answering Republican charges. They struck back by accusing Grant of being a liar. They said he was controlled by extremists. They said he would rule from the White House like a dictator. The Democratic attacks failed. Grant got more popular votes and electoral votes than Seymour. He won the election. It was a great victory for the military hero. Yet it also was the start of an administration that would suffer many problems. Ulysses Grant would prove to be much less successful in politics than in war. As Andrew Johnson prepared to leave the White House a few months after Grant's election, he would look back on some successes during his time as president. True, he had lost the political fight to control the rebuilding or reconstruction of the defeated southern states, but he had won the equally important fight to keep the presidency independent from Congress. Johnson also could look back on some successes in foreign relations. During his administration, he got Napoleon III of France to withdraw French forces from Mexico, and he got more territory for the United States. In the spring of 1867, the Russian minister in Washington made a surprise offer. He said his country was willing to sell some of its territory in North America. Secretary of State William Seward quickly prepared a treaty accepting the offer. Russia wanted $10 million for the land, Seward said the United States would pay only seven million dollars. Russia accepted, and the treaty was signed. The United States flag was raised over Alaska. Many Americans protested the purchase of Alaska. They thought seven million dollars was too much to pay for a worthless piece of frozen land. They said the deal was foolish. They called it Seward's Folly. In time, of course, these critics were proved wrong. Alaska's wealth in oil, natural gas, trees, fish, and animal skins makes its purchase one of the greatest deals any country ever made for territory. On March 4, 1869, Ulysses Grant traveled to Washington for his inauguration as the 18th President of the United States. Outgoing President Andrew Johnson refused to take part in the ceremony. Before Grant arrived, Johnson left the White House. As he walked out, he told a friend, I think I can already smell the fresh mountain air of my home in Tennessee. Americans had high hopes for their new president. They saw Grant 
as a strong and silent soldier, a great leader who had won a long and bitter war. But there was another side to Grant which most people did not see. During the Civil War, the general had been a great hero. For many years before that, however, he had been considered a failure. As a young man, Grant entered West Point, the nation's school for Army officers. He did poorly in his studies. He did not like responsibility. Somehow he completed his studies and became an Army officer. He fought in America's war against Mexico. After the war, Grant got into trouble. He drank too much whiskey, too often. The Army forced him to resign. For the next eight years, he tried one thing after another. He failed at each one. He tried farming, for example, and failed. He tried selling land and failed at that, too. At last, Grant appealed to his father for a job in a store. He held this low-paying job until the Civil War started. Then he finally got back into the Army. He got his chance to succeed. Still, the years of poverty and failure affected Ulysses Grant. They made him lack trust in his own judgment and abilities. This feeling showed itself when Grant reached the White House. The new president had little knowledge of politics or government, and he refused to ask for advice from experts. To do so, he felt, would show a lack of intelligence. For advice, he depended on close friends. These were the men with whom he had served during the Civil War. Grant had never been able to make much money. He liked and had great respect for men who had. He became friends with some of these wealthy men. He accepted gifts from them. This weakness for money and power became clear when he announced his choices for his cabinet. Grant named a rich businessman to be Treasury Secretary. The Senate rejected him. Grant named another rich businessman for Navy Secretary. This nomination was approved even though the man had never been on a ship. Grant named several other rich people and old military friends to the cabinet. Many lacked political experience. Some critics attacked the appointments. One critic said, Never was an administration begun with more hope and less ability. The best advisor Grant named was John Rawlins as Secretary of War. Rawlins was a good judge of men, and he was wiser than most of Grant's other friends. He alone, of all those around the President, would argue with Grant when he believed him to be wrong. Rawlins, however, was in poor health. His condition grew worse during the summer of 1869. Early in autumn, he died. Rawlins' death hurt President Grant deeply. But the lack of honest, wise advice in the White House would hurt the country even more. That will be our story in the next program of The Making of a Nation. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.